This conference will now be recorded. Welcome to my post-processing webinar. I appreciate your time on this Sunday. And I'll ask everyone to keep yourselves on mute during the session. And that way we get a very good recording for everyone that is attending. And I'm going to turn on my presentation now here. Uh, feel free to type questions into the chat window and and I'll address those at a couple points in the session and for sure at the end too. I just don't have anyone moderating the session so I won't be able to kind of keep up with it. All right. And I can hear someone not on mute. So I'm going to just uh, be sure to mute everyone here. Okay. And I think too, I'm going to, there we go. Okay. All right. All right, well, welcome. Welcome to my post-processing wildlife images webinar. I appreciate your time today and I hope that you find this helpful information. So the reason that I wanna cover post-processing is that I wanna help you to maximize the impact of what you witnessed and felt when you press that shutter. Uh, I believe that all raw images require some post-processing to become a finished image, even when it's right, perfectly right in the camera. So a couple things before I share my process and show you some before and after images. Firstly, it's very important to calibrate your screen periodically to ensure that your colors are visually correct. It's, it, the screens can get a little bit wonky, a little bit out of whack. Uh, and this includes laptops and desktop monitors. So it is important to periodically check those screen colorations. And I use a data color spider and it's a real easy device. You hang one half of it over the front of your screen and the other half over the back. You run the software, it prompts you through to start the process. I do it at night in the dark, it takes just a few minutes, and then it comes up with a calibration file that you can see the before and after and then apply it. And it uses that from that point forward until the next time you run it. And I have seen colors usually change just a little bit over the course of a, about a year. Uh, I think the, the software tool recommends that you do recalibration like once a month. Uh, I just don't stay on top of it that, that often. So I may do it twice a year. Uh, I suggest quarterly is a real uh, reasonable time frame. Uh, even if you do it just once a year, that's still good. It, it's amazing the, the variation in color. And you spend a lot of time when you're post-processing, looking at your images, looking at the colors, deciding what you like, what you don't like, and making changes. So you want those colors to be visually correct because you put it out on the net or you send it to print. And, and if it doesn't come back looking like what you saw on screen or someone buys that print, then that's not good. So this is, it's a, you know, relatively inexpensive product to buy and always good to have it on hand to do this periodically. If you don't currently do any kind of screen calibration, uh, you very likely, your screen is not showing colors correctly. So really important to do. A few other general tips for post-processing. One is that you really need to have, should have a standard file naming convention. So your photos are coming in with maybe your initials and then a sequential number off your camera. And if that's all you have, at some point that sequencing starts over and you could have two files with the same name coming into your computer. And it's very hard to go back and find images when it has only your initials, for example, and a sequential number. 
What I use is a four digit year, two digit month, two digit day. And then I know location. And then if it's one location with multiple species, I'll separate out photos by species and then a sequential number. And that number gets assigned when I initially copy the photos into my computer. And then it follows in every version of that file that I process. So my original raw image I shoot in Nikon has the NEF extension. And then when I've processed an image and I save a TIFF file, which saves, I save all the layers from Photoshop. It's the TIFF extension. And then I save a high resolution JPEG. And then I save a smaller, uh, usually 1,000 to 1,200 pixels on the longest side. And then I append that name with the word web. And then I save that as a high resolution JPEG. So I have four versions of a file from beginning to end. And sometimes, if I'm submitting the file to something, they'll to someone they'll require a renaming, which is the only time that I'll give it a different name. But that's this is the standard convention, and I'm always surprised that people don't have that kind of standard naming convention. It has helped me to find images from 10 years ago very very easily. Um, when I upload my images to SmugMug, my website, I always have that file name with it. And I can see that name go directly into my folders. I have a million and a half images. So to find, be able to find a photo instantaneously is important to me. So I can't emphasize that enough. And I, I use a very meaningful folder structure as well in how I, I keep my, fo uh, my photos. They're by location first. And, the, and it varies by person. Everybody's got their own organization way uh, approach. And for me, it's location first. So for example, Grand Teton National Park, I go there every year, or it's Alaska, or it's Canada. And then it's by year and trip and species. And then behavior. When I do snowy owls, I have static shots where they're perched, or I have them when they're hunting or taking off. And so I'll, just to help myself organize my my photos in some logical way, I'll maybe separate them, those that are perched versus those that are taking off versus those that are flying. Otherwise, if it's, say, Africa, it's the continent, and then it's country, and then it's um, uh, location, destination, and then it's species, and then that's it. That's as far as I go. So it depends on the trip how much further I go. Um, backup is critically important. I have two RAID 5 drives and I save, I have a one drive in Minnesota and one in Arizona and I have all my photos replicated on both. And I use the cloud with my uh, website for storing my high resolution JPEG. So my processed image only and, and then, um, at least I've got things in the cloud that I've processed and I've got two drives. The RAID system drives allow me to, if I have one drawer, I have, there's four bays in the 72 terabyte drives. And if one uh, drive dies, which it's not weather, it's when, uh, I can send that drive in, get it replaced without losing any of my data. There's still potential problems. I have had drives go bad, so I know it happens. And it's not fun to try to send it into a company that tries to recover these photos that come back with these meaningless names to the files. And you've got thousands and thousands of photos mixed up together. One of the suggestions I have is to use standard aspect ratio cropping when possible. When you are using standard aspect ratios like two by three, four by five, five by seven, one by one for panos, maybe one by two, one by three, one by four, whatever works for you. It's helpful when it goes to, comes to printing, especially when you're having a print lab print for you to have these standard naming conventions for yourself and for your customers. Your customers then can order a print without having to do any cropping. Now I am not a hundred percent uh, consistent on standard aspect ratio cropping. I will look to see if it if it works, and if it doesn't, for for my personal taste on the composition, 
I skew off of it. And for me, what's more important is that the photo is exactly how I want it to look. And, and so I don't follow it as much as I probably should. Um, I think when it comes to having your photos on anything on the on the internet, be sure you've got some kind of branding on it. Uh, there's a, it's amazing how good the internet is at retaining our photos. So at least have a copyright symbol and your name, uh, maybe also a slash and then all rights reserved. Uh, I use a photo logo. It's uh, the company is a photologo.co, and I know a lot of people that use this tool, uh, this company, to have them create a photo logo, a signature for you to use, and that's worked really well for me. I I did it once. I like the way it looks, and I've stuck with it for multiple years. So now it's just pretty much my my online signature. So I think always having uh, that something on the photo that designates that it's yours is important, uh, especially if you're posting to Facebook or putting things on the internet that you don't want them to be uh, right clickable and people being able to save them off the computer, off of the internet onto their own computer, uh, especially without being able to have your logo on it. You know, on Facebook, you can right click on any photo and save them off. So. Uh, you know, that's why I downsized the images with a web extension and putting my photo logo on them before I put them on Facebook. And then for basically minimal embedded metadata, uh, I think your name and your copyright. I also add other information like country because I submit my images to Getty for licensing, for commercial licensing and they require country to be noted. And I don't want to have to go back and enter that each time I submit groups of photos. Additionally, title and caption can be quite helpful to embed right in the photos. And that way, if you're posting them into a website or submitting them for stock agencies, all of that information can come with the photo. Um, other things like keywords is also helpful if you're submitting it all to a photo agency. I know Getty requires a minimum of five keywords and I uh, have gotten used to putting in up to 10 per photo and I'm learning what keywords they recognize. So I'm entering that as part of my initial copying from my cards to my computer for given folders to minimize how much work I have to do on the back end for submission. I just include this slide on my backup system as a FYI. Uh, these are the two, type, two drives that I have that store all of my photos. They are, in my opinion, expensive drives. Um, they came from uh, photo, um, BH uh, photo. And, and I, I would use the same drives again. Uh, I find that opening files and processing image is fast. And even though it's an external drive, it's not uh, internal within my processor or bot main box. It's, it's super fast. I have absolutely no delays that I uh, am uncomfortable with with it. And then when I'm in the field, I use a laptop and a portable five terabyte drive to store my backup of my cards, then from which I copy to my desktops when I arrive back home. And then I mentioned I store my processed images on SmugMug, my website for my photos. So here's a photo or a slide of my process. So you know, I, I show this to let you know what I use, but there are so many good tools out there, software tools on the market. I don't profess to say that these are the best. They just, they work for me. And I'm sure I'm very, I'm not nearly as technical as I'm sure some of you are. And so I'm sure I'm not using these tools to the extent that they can be leveraged. But what I do use them for, they work, and I'm very happy. And for me, if it's not broke, don't fix it. I just stick with these, and I haven't changed much in the last uh, number of years. So to initially load my photos and rename them 
to that standard naming convention and then to delete those images that are out of focus or that compositionally there's just no recovery from or I don't want to bother with and then to rank my favorites I use a product through camera bits it's called photo mechanic and I have been using that for gosh it's probably 15 years now and I have found it to be the fastest tool to run through my raw images I'm not looking at uh, any kind of DNG or JPEG version. It's my raw images and I like it. I, it works for me. And so I start there. And once I've decided which ones I want to process, that's when I'll uh, click the edit option on a photo. And that takes me into my second major set of steps. So I clean up an enhancement and I use Adobe Photoshop. I bring it into camera raw first. And I'll do initial cleanup, which I'll touch on what that includes. And then I'll use Photoshop and I'll use the Topaz Labs Denoise AI tool to remove noise on my images. And I'm just taking these are 99% wildlife images. And then I'll also use the DxO Nick collection, which has come a long way since Nick owned it and then Google bought it. And then and then DxO bought the package and it's really an excellent set of tools and then occasionally I use the Tony Kuiper luminosity masks and I'll mention why and when I do that and then once a photo is processed then I quote unquote publish it I update my smug mug photo uh, library uh, that portion of my website that stores all of my photos with the high resolution JPEGs I'll submit images to Getty I'll post some images to Facebook, Instagram, and, and I, I continue to store my raw plus these TIFF and JPEG versions. As I go through this, these slides, I will pause before I show you some example photos. And so if you have any questions about what we're reviewing on the slides, please feel free to type them into the chat window and then I'll, I'll review the chat questions in just a few minutes. So I wanted to share this slide with you. Dean Harrison was the co-founder of Out of Africa Wildlife Park in Camp Verde, Arizona, and he wrote a book called Return to Eden. And in that book, he writes about instincts in wildlife. And it's I find it to be extremely helpful in being able to predict and to understand behavior and what is it about those instincts that then draws my attention and evokes a feeling or emotion in me. And he outlined in his book, the primary instincts of wildlife are self-preservation or safety, acquisition of food, maintenance of territory, their space, whatever they define their space to be, and socialization, as he put it, marriage and family relations. And then there are a number of supportive instincts, seasonal change, weather's change, like storms coming through or possession. You know, I have this and especially with food, you cannot take this away from me. Protection, protection of themselves, protection of their family unit or their clan or their pride. Play and chase. Play is instinctive in animals that are warm blooded, so not as Dean put it in his book, not something that amphibians and reptiles have an interest or an instinct to do. Uh, the chase, you know, you, you know, you, the prompt when something is running by you, especially, you know, big cats, you know, <sighs> not time to time to go get it. To take advantage of an opportunity, holding and biting, exploration and adventure and courtship. And we see that a lot in birds and how they how the males are always more beautiful, you know, to attract those females. And these are all unlearned and stimulus response behaviors that then when we see that, and it's different for each person, for me, uh, I am attracted to and have a passion for feeling that deep connection to wildlife. And it's when I had my aha moment years ago, that's what I realized what I'm so drawn to are feeling the love and the connection to wildlife and that that pure raw um, 
uh, predictable behavior that when you see it, you know it. And seeing humorous moments when you see little little ones in wildlife playing, um, uh, when you see them helping each other, um, all of these things evoke these emotions. And these are the things that when I'm processing images, I'm looking for, I'm looking for those photos that, that, that show what I felt in that moment. And, and by understanding, and I'm sharing this with you, because I think when you understand what's driving their behavior, what are these instincts that you can put yourself in a situation maybe more easily or at least more identifiably to bring some emotion or evoke some feeling with yourself and your viewers. When you are culling your images and selecting those that you want to process, these are some of the things that I take into consideration. And I'm also trying to do, use these elements, these considerations, apply them when I'm taking the photo. It's sometimes it's so instantaneously, there's no time to be looking at all of these things all at once in the moment. However, the more that you keep these things in mind, the more they can influence whether you stand up or lay down or move to one side or the other or wait for that perfect light or uh, just always doing that perimeter check around the around your subject. So first and foremost, eyes being tack sharp to me, that's the, the window to the soul. And that's personally how I feel that deep connection to wildlife. And so having those our eyes be sharp to me is absolutely essential. The second thing that I think is is really important are that there aren't background, distinctive background lines, whether it's vertical or horizontal, not just a horizon line, that they don't go through or merge with the subject's head or neck. And it could be that the image is just so great and so powerful that that doesn't matter. But quite often, it will drive me to maybe clone out or mute a line so that it's not as distinctive because I think it does take away from the power of the connection with the subject. Um, one of the other considerations I think is there's nice tonal contrast between the head of the subject and background. I think being at eye level with a subject, I think the closer you are to eye level, the more it feels that you've entered their world versus kind of looking down on them, particularly when it's a shorter subject than yourself. No appendages being clipped. So tips of ears, the feet, a tip of a tail, a tip of a wing. Sometimes if you accidentally clip one of these things in your photo, you can crop to take it to still get a, a really terrific image out of it. You just want to be sure that when you are cropping, you're not clipping or cropping, excuse me, on one of those elements, unless visually it really drives the viewer's eye to the target and or you you crop mid body so it's not right on a joint an elbow or knee that kind of thing um, when you can you want visual separation between the body parts so for example with an antelope and you've got two ears you've got two horns and depending on the direction that the antelope is looking you might have overlap from your view of the horns or of the ears, or there not might be slight overlaps. And unless it's a perfect profile shot where the overlap is, you, you it works. Most of the time, it's not quite that. And it doesn't look quite as good because it's just partially merging. So I try to try to minimize the overlap at all so that there, you know, it is visually more appealing. And no blown out white highlights on the subject. Uh, that is probably one of the places where I have, where it's the most challenging is photographing eagles in Alaska. It's so easy to blow out that white on the their head or their tails or both. And the, the importance of using exposure compensation or under or overexposing depending on how you shoot whether it's manual or letting shutter or aperture or iso float 
in the camera, but making sure that you don't blow out those. Sometimes you can't avoid blowing out something in the background when you're photographing a bird in a tree. Uh, you'll likely get bright light coming through the tree branches, and so you're likely to blow out those bright lights so that you don't underexpose for the bird in the tree. Uh, and you can crop that out later, or as long as the, I mean, the viewer's eye is always going to go to the brightest spot in the photo. Uh, but if your subject is powerful enough, uh, it's okay. And if you say you, you shoot high key where you're intentionally blowing out all of the background, that's okay. You just want to be sure you don't blow out the detail on the subject because you'd want to bring, be able to at least have the option of bringing some of that detail back. Uh, sometimes you can fudge it a little bit, have a few highlights blown out, but you don't want to do it too much. So a couple more slides and then I'm going to pause. So for cleanup, the two, the three things that I do for every photo is first to identify where I want the viewer's attention to go. And I call that targets, whether it's one target, meaning the eyes usually, or it's maybe their uh, tail or a tail that's curved and in the air, or it's the claws, or the talons, or the beak, or the teeth. Usually it's one set of targets on one subject. If it's two subjects, maybe it's the eyes of both. Maybe it's the, the interaction point between the two subjects, that that is also a target. So identifying the target or targets will then drive what changes that you'll make when it comes to enhancement. So that's the first thing. And that's usually one of the things I'm looking for when I'm choosing a photo to process is, is it really clear what the target is and how well have I shown that? The other thing that I do with every photo is to maximize the white and black tones. And I'll show you how I do that. I also have been using the Topaz Denoise AI tool to eliminate digital noise and sharpen the image. And I do that with every image and I do it first um, before I do anything else. And uh, I think I've heard in the past that others using Topaz Denoise AI also do the step first. Uh, I don't know what's the best way, but that's what I do and I like it. I like it that way. I like knowing what impact it had before it has before I make any other changes. So those are the three things that I do with every photo. Now, the second column when needed, it just depends on the image. And these are all to me cleanup steps that I'm doing before I choose what enhancements I want to make. So I might have to correct white balance or exposure or the color. I need to try to recover blown out highlights, increase my shadows. I might have to straighten them and quite very often I have to straighten the horizon line. Uh, crop if I feel it needs it, eliminating minor or major distractions. And then when it comes to enhancement, uh, my primary purpose is to draw attention to the target. And so to do that, I am making very purposeful and small adjustments to create contrast that will draw the viewer's eye to the target or targets. Uh, and I do that by having some things be illuminated versus some things more in the shadow, light and dark, cool and warm, texture versus smooth, vibrant versus muted. Quite often grass is so bright, I'll mute the grass and then I'll, I'll create more vibrance on the subject. And it just varies by photo, but my always my intent is to draw more attention or as much attention as I can to the target without overdoing it. Always small, very purposeful adjustments. All right, so I am going to pause now and I'm going to look in the chat room and see if there's any questions. And so I had uh, uh, Ken suggest he strongly, I strongly second the use of a RAID system and Ken uses Synology. Thanks, Ken. And uh, Bruce uh, Fisher noted, I think Smug Mug now stores raw images. Yes, at an additional cost. And I have not uh, purchased that service with them. Uh, I've looked at the terabyte 
um, doll and dollars per terabyte that they're charging and I'm not quite ready to make that investment uh, but I I have seen that that's available um, Alice do you find that you need to make adjustments for images meant for screen sharing versus print um, that's a good really good question um, Alice for printing it depends to me on the medium so for printing on aluminum, I find that the image, I lose some of the detail in the shadows, so I need to make it a little bit brighter. Um, and uh, that's, that's really the only thing I've noticed. Um, I find that I, I print through Bay Photo, and I find that kind of what I see on my screen is what I get in the finished image. I do have color correction turned on on Bay Photo just to be sure in case I, I'm a little bit out of whack with my colors. Um, but the only adjustments I've, I've noticed are, are when printing on aluminum. That, that requires the image to be a little bit brighter. Uh, do you ever use flash for filling shadows? Beverly is asking me that. Um, most of the time, no. Um, could be some of my laziness and just not wanting to deal with flash and being able to, I'm doing things in such rapid fire that uh, I don't want to wait for the flash to recycle. So that's more, more than anything. I do find, uh, I obviously use it all the time with uh, my hummingbird photography. That's always multi-flash stations. Uh, and when photographing birds in a tree, I have done fill flash at times when they're just perched, but not when there's action. Um, Rich, Rich Fisher's Backblaze offers unlimited cloud storage for about 60 to $7 per year for a single computer. Yeah, Rich, I actually, I have tried a whole bunch of different backup systems and it's because of the volume of photos I have I tried backblaze and they will and they will continue to add more storage as you need it but they over time they slow down the upload rate for for additional storage that you need and I I've never been able to fully back up all of my images with a with any of the Kind of consumer level backup solutions just based on the number of photos i have i have about a million and a half images and i just i just haven't found a solution that supports that kind of volume without paying for a more commercial level service uh, i've even tried i said i'll i'll send you the hard drive to copy everything off of nope 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 it's got to go through over the internet up to the cloud and I went through one year where I, I was only at about 25% by the end of the year of my total upload. And I kept calling them and talked to them about why it wasn't working. And ultimately, I just dropped out of the service. Um, Rich said uh, he's got, he has 28 terabytes. Uh, do you have 28 terabytes in uh, Backblaze? And he said it took him a couple months. Oh, and he's got he's got 28 terabytes. That's very good, very good. Yeah, they maybe have improved it since I did it. Um, I have since moved to having RAID systems and two in two states, and that's uh, seems to be working very well for me. So I haven't chosen to to switch on that yet. Um, and I'm trying to submit more photos to Getty. Not that I expect I'm going to make a whole lot of money, but that way I can put my son as the recipient of any cash that comes in and assuming AI doesn't replace all of our wildlife images, um, I would hope to continue to make a few dollars on that for him. Um, all right, any other questions at this time? Otherwise, I'm going to get right into some sample photos. Okay, I'm going to keep going. So at this point, what I want to do is share some photos and I want to share the before and after images. And then once I've done that, then I thought I'd go into some of these tools because I'll reinforce that these tools are what I use. I think there are equally good tools that 
functionality that other software programs offer. So I do not say that these are the tools that you should use. I, I What I always say is pick the tools that you can comfortably learn and will consistently use. And as those tools improve, so will your post-processing. Uh, I, I like Photoshop. I never ended up using Lightroom because I started with Photoshop and I was comfortable with it. And that's where I've stuck. And uh, the DxO NIC filters, um, they have improved immensely. Uh, and I've continued to use them, love them. Uh, but, you know, it varies by person. You pick what works for you. All right, so let me share some photos. So I'm sharing some photos that are in Photo Mechanic. So this is my uh, Photo Mechanic, Camera Bits Photo Mechanic. And this is, again, the tool that I use to copy images onto the computer from my cards, rename them, add metadata, uh, pull them, and then rank them. And what I want to share with you is the raw image and the processed images side by side. And so you can see you know, for examples, uh, what changes I made to improve on an image. So the photo on the left will always be the raw image where I started, and the photo on the right is the processed image. And so it's a NEF file on the left side, raw out of my camera, no changes made, and then a TIFF file on the right. So I'll go back at some point if you want, and I'll share with you the changes I did make specifically in layers in Photoshop. So this was a picture of the mountain lion that's at Arizona Sonora Desert Museum, and I was using a 600 millimeter lens. And this photo was taken back in 2014, so it has been a long time. I always liked this image of him. This is Cruz. So he's in a cave and leaning out, and it's late in the day, but boy, it sure still came out kind of flat uh, in the colors. So one of the things that I wanted to do is to bring out that detail in coloration in the rocks. And by applying uh, the color effects NIC filters to bring up vibrance, and, uh, and I can show you what changes I made. Um, and one of them that I used was sunlight in color effects in the in the DxO filters. And that brought out a lot of color in the rocks and in him. Um, I also cropped out part of the rock on the left side. And you'll see that I, I did darken down that background entirely. Again, creating contrast between the subject and the background. Um, I also generally 100% of the time will increase the brightness of the catch light in the eye, excuse me, and also the reflection of that catch light in, in the color of underneath the pupil. I don't increase the brightness of the entire eye. It's only those two elements of, and, and if there's any white showing in the eye, then I'll increase that brightness as well. But you can see, you know, the, the image on the left is a so-so uh, image in terms of processing, but a great photo of him. The image on the right really, really highlights him a lot more, really draws your eye to him. Uh, first, and here's an image of, these are three juvenile lions in South Africa. And you can see I cropped, and I was careful not to crop into the ears of the juveniles uh, that are uh, loving on their sibling. Um, I love this image because of the eyes of a lion looking at me. Um, and I did pop that light, the light of those eyes. I could have cropped the little leaf that's right by the forehead. That probably would have been an improvement. I just didn't take the time to do it. But um, you can see, um, you know, I had to I had to crop on some of the body of the lion and on the on the other two, not the one on the ground. And it would have been nice had this one leg not been going off the finished image. But I was cropping too close into the whiskers of the lion on the ground. So, you know, some things I give on based on what's available in the in the frame. So this is a 
heard of ranch horses running in snow. This was taken up in Montana during a Triple D workshop. I, we do uh, horse roundups where we'll run horses um, from far away towards the photographers and uh, you get them you know running snow flying and the the key thing that is so important with snow is that you know first of all i'm usually when it's a cloudy condition in the sky i'm usually shooting at a plus one to plus one and a third exposure compensation because the camera is just trying to get to an 18% middle gray in the average tonality and and it generally will turn snow gray unless you do some kind of composition or compensation and I'm okay with some of the snow blowing out I don't want to blow it out entirely and so I'm usually slightly less than what it how bright it really could be and so in post quite often I'm bringing up that slightly gray snow to white and so important to do and sometimes you don't see that it's kind of gray in the photo I mean I see it it's clear when the two are side by side but when you're looking at it uh, in your whatever tool you use sometimes it's not obvious if you're real close to white uh, but it, boy a little can go a long way and I'll, I'll show you a couple of things that I do to bring up that white and you can see the the colors are punched a little bit the background evergreens are a little bit darker so creating again more contrast between the subjects and the background uh, with that you, you get this kind of flat look when the snow is kind of gray and the backgrounds kind of muted and the horses are a little bit muted so punching punching the the vibrance of the horses and darkening the background and brightening the foreground really draws that contrast forward so the next photo is of a moose a bull moose in grand teton national park and i like the fact that he was reaching up to eat something off the tree and so i made it intentionally made it a vertical composition when when you've got a subject you want them generally off center and you want them if possible looking into the frame and so if they're looking up then you leave a lot more space at the top of the frame if they're looking down you leave a lot more space at the bottom of the frame so that it gives them room to look into the frame in your composition in this case we've got the telephone wire and it looks like i've got a big old dust spot so part of the the fixing cleaning up was removing that telephone wire and getting rid of that smudge and in the enhanced image you see a lot more punch of the the whites the um, whites are brighter the sedge grasses are bushes are are more vibrant um, they were more uh, maybe not quite as red and vibrant as what I'm showing in the processed image but I, I liked it better um, I, as I look at it it probably could be straightened just a little bit um, maybe I avoided doing that because I was already a little tight on the bottom of the frame um, but uh, and and I was doing this presentation a few days ago and someone suggested would you have cropped it as a horizontal and yeah that's a, certainly a possibility um, I will say that if I go back to any image I've ever processed I'm very likely to process it slightly different a second time so I don't have other than the three things identifying the target and maximizing my whites and blacks and uh, running deep it do it through denoise and sharpening I'm generally doing something different or a different way each time uh, next photo this is from Kutsumatine grizzly bear sanctuary in British Columbia uh, we were traveling we're staying on a boat and then traveling on a zodiac boat around the estuaries in the uh, sanctuary and uh, so we were up close, pretty close to this bear. Uh, I was probably shooting with a two, uh, 70 to 200 lens. And I just loved the reflection in the water and, and the clean claws. And so I cropped pretty tight, cropping in on the body, again, not on a joint. 
and, and then retaining the reflection of the claws in the water, but eliminating most of the foreground and really zeroing in on the claws and this profile photo of this bear. And you can see there's the eyes have been lightened, the whole body, the color has been um, popped a little bit. And I use a DxO Nick filter called Detail Extractor, and that I use on the claws. I use it on claws, talons, sometimes on wings of birds uh, when I want to punch a little more detail. It's it's uh, can be really bad if you use too much of it. Uh, so I, I'm as I say, with all adjustments, very small adjustments. Uh, next one, these are three lions in uh, South Africa. And you see I had to straighten the horizon line. This was a little cockeyed. I have, I show in my viewfinder now always my horizon line. I use specifically, I have it set for the horizontal, but you can have it set for both horizontal and vertical. And I try to watch that when I'm shooting because I don't want to have to worry about straightening in post, particularly if I have a tight composition. In this case, I didn't, I tried not to crop anything on the left side, cropped a bit on the right, cropped a little bit, uh, most of it on the foreground. So the, the top of the image is about where I started. Uh, just to, maybe it looks like a little bit probably with straightening the image that I lost. And then, you know, darkening foreground, darkening background, brightening up the eyes, brightening up uh, the bodies of the lions. And I'm showing these examples to show that, you know, it's it doesn't have to be huge changes, but it can make a difference in how it looks. So this is a snow leopard in Montana at Triple D, photographed during a winter shoot, and I'll be doing this workshop in January up there. Um, this is, the biggest change here is making white white. And uh, what, an, what an amazing, I think, what an amazing small change to make, to make, to really help things to pop more. Uh, so making white white, and, and then putting a little bit of vibrance and contrast in the leopard itself. And I, I improve, increase the brightness a bit on the eyes, but otherwise that's it. Um, it was good to go. Not doesn't, I don't always get lucky that way. This is Sage. He's a mountain lion, rescued mountain lion at Out of Africa Wildlife Park. And we photograph him before dawn and we're shooting into the sun as it's rising. So I always suggest to people to exclude the sky and the composition. And in this case, uh, you just get beautiful catch, uh, catch light on his eyes. And uh, you can see I had to straighten the horizon a little bit and crop just a little bit and then brought up the vibrance and always bring up the eyes a little bit that catch light in the eye and then the reflection under that catch light this is um a wolf pack on a white tail gear white tail deer carcass in minnesota and i also teach at minnesota wildlife connection which is where this was taken and uh, i loved the possessiveness within the the group of wolves uh, the pack there's always a hierarchy there's an alpha male and there's an alpha female and when you have uh, the males all together the alpha male will let the other males know hey this is mine i'm i'm eating now you come after i'm done and it was snowing and i just love that communication between them and that eye contact uh, so I cropped uh, everything, the, both the trees on the left and the right, and then making sure I didn't clip that antler on the deer, leaving some space to the right of that, and then really cropped off absolutely nothing off the wolves, um, wanted to, to stay focused on them. And using a detail extractor on the teeth, because to me the target targets were the eyes of the wolves and the teeth and their faces. You know, I wanted to make sure that, that their noses were tack sharp, their eyes were tack sharp and the teeth were showing uh, very, very distinctly. Uh, 
these two images, not a lot of change. I'll show you this as an example in Photoshop. Uh, it, I ended up, you know, making the colors in the background a little more vibrant. I cropped a little bit off of the left of the frame and brought up the brightness of the eyes of the owl. So those were, you know, sometimes you get, you get lucky. Uh, this was another image in uh, Canada, in British Columbia, in Kutsumatin Grizzly Bear Sanctuary. And I definitely clipped a lot off of the foreground grass. I had to straighten the horizon again and then uh, cropped quite a bit off the off the uh, bottom of the image that foreground grasses you can see again the targets in this case were the teeth and the faces of these bears and so not a lot of change to them other than just bringing up the attention on them and then darkening the background bringing a little bit more contrast into the background The next one's kind of fun to look at. So this is a uh, possum and these are her little babies on her back and they can have like 10 or 11 of them and they will carry them around on them. And if one drops off, they just leave it in the wild. Um, possums are so important. They eat so many ticks for us to get rid of in Minnesota. And the one thing that I felt was important here was to get as much of those eyes to pop on all those little babies. And I just love the one, that second one in the, in, on her back that's yelling. Um, I, I thought that really made the photo. And this is taken during um, my spring babies workshop at Minnesota Wildlife Connection. And if you look at both images side by side, you will see the catch light in each of those eyes is brighter. And that's just one of the mo really important things to do. So I, I cropped a little bit off the right of the composition, uh, nothing off the left, nothing off the top. And I fixed, she had a little bit of a bloody tip tail. I fixed that in post. And then I really focused on the eyes. And I'll, I'll show you that also as an example, uh, because you can really see the difference if you look from the left to the right, how much the eye, the catch light in the eye has been popped, popped meaning increased brightness. Uh, here's another photo from Minnesota Wildlife Connection. This was taken during Spring Babies. This is a juvenile silver fox. And when I took the original composition, I was looking for that reflection in the water. And, and I loved the fact that, that this kit was down getting a drink of water at that moment. But I felt like the rest of the composition was very busy looking. And I didn't want all those branches and trees in the, in the finished image. So I cropped pretty tight. Uh, you can see it's really just focusing on not even the entire reflection. A lot of times I'll suggest that you not have a equally divide, divided reflection line between the top of your composition and the bottom, having a third to two third difference. In other words, in this case, the, the above the water part of the image is about two thirds and the reflection is even, even less than a third. It's probably a fifth of the photo is the reflection. And I think uh, it, it is a more interesting composition when your eye isn't having to flip back and forth uh, half and half in, in the finished image. So I cropped off quite a bit of it. Uh, the, the, um, the other thing I definitely did was brighten up the eyes again, the catch light and the reflection of that in the eye. Uh, that's pretty much always a target I'm looking at improving. And I probably popped the white in the tail a little bit, in the tip of the tail, uh, and darkened down a bit of the background. Uh, I use, um, quite often I'll use the color effects darken, lighten uh, filter, and it just puts a nice vignette. And I usually only apply about half of it. It's Otherwise, it's too noticeable. Any change I make, I don't really want you to know what change I made. If, I mean, you can tell by viewing the start and the finish, but I don't want the end user or the end viewer to be able to look at an image and know exactly what I did. I've seen images where the vignette is so strong, it's obvious that they put a vignette on it. And, it, and to me, it, it 
quite often looks overdone, but that's a personal opinion. If that's what suits you, more power to you. Um, so these are two baboons in South Africa, or three baboons in South Africa. And I, I loved this because I love the fact that the baby's nursing, um, both mom and baby are looking at this other mother that's walking by. And I wanted all three of them just to remain in the composition. And, and I had to crop and I, it was a tough crop decision because I didn't want to crop on the elbow of the baboon on the left. So I cropped just after that, but before the beginning of the next leg, cause I didn't want it to be mid leg. And, and then my focus was definitely in bringing up the eyes and the detail on the face of mom and the baby. And I did a little bit of color correction. Uh, I thought there was a little too much blue in the image. And I find that quite often there is too much blue in that shows up in images. And uh, even, you know, when I'm using auto white balance, which is what I'm generally using unless I'm doing snowy owls and it's overcast. And then I might use like 6250 Kelvin right in there, but usually I'm on auto white balance. And, and in this case, I just felt like there was just too much blue coming up in the gray of the, the baboons. And sometimes I look at the before and after, I think, you know, I kind of overcorrected. And as I look at this, maybe a little more brown than, than maybe than there should be, but it's somewhere in between for sure. Um, it's always good to go back and look at your photos from where you started to the finished image and, and be objective. And I find that I can be more objective the more time that's gone by between one, when I took the picture and two, sometime after I've processed it and I go back and look at what I did when I processed it. So here's a cheetah in South Africa and I intentionally overexposed uh, plus 2.7 and I wanted to get more of that high key look. And, and then I, I felt like I liked the cheetah going, moving from left to right more than right to left. So I flipped it in the end. I also brightened up the background. I just wanted that even more of a distinctive, uh, high key look. And I use, this is one of those images. And there's a few in this collection where I did use the Tony Kuiper luminosity masks to bring up the dark tones to to darken the dark tones without having to paint them. And I'll, I can show you that too, if we have time. Uh, this is a wolf, uh, in Minnesota and, uh, really the only changes I needed to make, I, I, again, I brightened up the eyes a little bit. Uh, you can see the, maybe, maybe it's noticeable that the needles of the tree are just a little bit more vibrant not a lot, a little bit. And the details of the um, wolf have been, uh, the color, color contrast is a little punched. Um, probably the biggest difference is if you look at the snow uh, mound that he's on, on the left versus the right, that it's more true to white than gray. And those are why it's just so important to always check those whites uh, when you're photographing in snow. Uh, almost finished looking at some sample images. Uh, here's a before and after. Again, the whites have been punched and <laughs> there was, I just noticed this, there was a piece of meat being thrown <laughs> to the wolf. We were photographing a wolf in the river rapids and uh, there's a meat piece of meat in the air that obviously I saw at the time that I processed it because it's no longer there. Um, uh, so you can see the trees in the background are darkened. Um, the white is more true to white. The wolf is a little brighter, uh, lightened up a bit and the, um, uh, the colors uh, of the wolf itself, himself, are a little more vibrant. All right, last sample. And I'm, again, I'm going to pause for questions before I go into the tools themselves. So this is an eagle. This was in March up in Alaska. And uh, I love photographing the eagles in snow. It's harder, though, because you, 
I have a mirrorless camera and while the tracking works great normally in snow sometimes it can accidentally pick up on the snowflakes so it, it can be challenging and in this image I didn't like the snow that's on the rocks in the background um, the also, other obvious problem is the eagle is flying out of the frame and so when I cropped it I cropped it so that it looked as though the eagle was flying into the frame so more coming from uh, from the right towards the left and I uh, cloned out the snow uh, that was on the rocks in the background. Um, probably tried to bring back a little bit of detail too in the head. Looks like it's just lost a little bit. Uh, the general rule of thumb when you're photographing an eagle against a dark background, surprisingly you want to use a minus exposure compensation. When you're photographing an eagle against a bright background, you want to use a plus exposure compensation. Uh, and if you Want to know more about that we can talk offline about that okay before i go into the actual tools i'll open it back up see if there's any questions that have been added um thanks steve uh let's see pam my computer is not sharing and my malware is blocking your site for some reason i'll have to leave okay sounds good pam what color spaces do you work in so um this is a question from Rich. Um, I use the Adobe Pro Photo. Um, one improvement that uh, SmugMug has made with their uh, website work is that they no longer, they used to say you could upload an sRGB because that's, of course, what most of our computers are showing. However, now they will, they will uh, show the actual color space that you are that you have uploaded and i'm glad that over all of these years i have always been careful to use adobe rgb i have now since moved to pro photo rgb but all of these years um, our cameras default to srgb i've always changed that to our adobe rgb and i've always had my color space set up in camera raw to adobe camera raw to use the rgb color space and i encourage you to do the same while srgb is great for the computer it's it doesn't have the range of colors that adobe rgb uh, does and and when it comes to printing uh, you get a, a much you have a much broader range of colors available to you with o adobe rgb um question what's the difference between detail extractor and sharpening um good question i will share i'll show that um yvonne i'm sorry i'm late to the meeting due to sound issues but what is a detail extractor is it a plug-in or a program so detail extractor is a uh, filter in color effects pro in the dxo knit collection so it's one of many and one that i use in particular for talons and claws and i will i will show that um, and okay, um, I'm going to go through some samples now and I'm absolutely welcome to, uh, show anything else after I've shared some of these things with you, uh, whatever, whatever you want to see. Okay. I'm going to go back out. Um, and Alice is asking me, do you, do you ever use DxO pure raw? I haven't yet. Um, I think DxO is, is really continuing to improve upon the, improve upon on their product offerings and I'm just so impressed with them so it wouldn't surprise me at some point if I do start using some of that their tools beyond the, the DxO NIC filters um, I also really like the Topaz uh, products the Topaz AI products I use pretty much exclusively the denoise AI tool for both digital noise and sharpening but I have purchased some of their other AI tools. I just haven't started using them. Um, oh, thank you. Thanks, Kelly. All right, let me share some samples with you now. Uh, let's see, there was a question about the DxO uh, detail extractor. So let me share that first. I'm going to bring up um, a few photos. I'm going to, I want to bring them up in there in the TIFF version to show you the steps I went through and what I did. So I'm going to uh, close down all of my my um, layers. So when I first go into Adobe Camera Raw, that's where I'll maximize my blacks and my whites, and I'll show you what I do with that. Um, and then when I come into Photoshop, I will immediately use the DX or the, excuse me the Topaz Denoise AI and 
a tool. And I used to create a background copy before I did that. And I don't do that anymore. I just, I just go directly in. So, uh, so the first step is background copy was for the purpose of using the Topaz Denoise AI. And then uh, you can see if you look, I'm going to click on and off on a, uh, on a layer in Photoshop. So I'm down here in the layers. And if you look at his eyes, this bear's eyes, all I did was bring up the catch light and the white in the eyes. And hopefully you can see that comparison change. And then the next one was to darken the background. So not him, not the bear, just the background. And then the next one was detail extractor. Now look at his claws and it's, it's going to be mostly evident in his back paw in the, the, the three claws. So as I turn that on and off, look at the look at the claws. You'll just see it just a little more detail come out. Again, very subtle changes. And then the last one I did, I think I just brightened him up a little bit overall. All right. So that's that detail extractor. And let me show you um, another example of detail extractor. Um, let's see, I probably used it in my Eagle. I like it on claws and talons and, and on elephants and rhinos. I think it works really well for them too. Um, I may not have used it on him. Oh, because the claws really aren't showing here. Let me, let me use it on um on the fish just so you can see it so um the nick collection tool it sits off to the side uh, as a menu and the dxo net collection you you buy the entire collection for one cost and and again there's multiple ways to do these things so this just happens to be the way that i do it so in color effects pro i have my favorite things that I like to do and and I have them highlighted as my favorite. So I have dark and light and center, detail extractor, graduated neutral, neutral density, pro contrast, sunlight, tonal contrast, and vignette blur. And I'm going to go to detail extractor. Now it comes up as a default amount of setting. And to me, that's just, whoa, I hate that look. But if I just want to brush it, I always I would say 95% of the time when I'm in any of these filters, I let it come up with the default. And sometimes I change it in the Nick collection, you know, change what the settings are, slide one thing a different way, and then click brush to bring it back into Photoshop and paint it. Other times I will just accept the default, but click brush, which brings it in with a mask that then I can paint it the way that I want it. So it hasn't applied it yet. And it comes up with this brush tool. I'm on the paint tool. I can select the hundred percent opacity and now I can just paint the fish, for example, increase the size of my brush. And you can see as I go over this fish that it just is bringing a little more detail out on the fish. And I will just do that. And let me click it on and off so you can see, you see it just brings a little bit more detail out on the fish. And that's detail extractor. And maybe I might choose to do it on the beak as well. Sometimes the beak is nice to do it on. And, and so then you see, if you look at the beak, you see the before and after, it just brought a little bit more detail. I would never apply it to the whole thing, not detail extractor. Um, sometimes detail extractor um, works very nice on feathers on birds. So let's say I'm going to use it just on the, the inside of the feathers here. So let's say I'm going to paint it at 100% and see what happens here. Oops. I have to um, hang on one second. It thinks I'm outside of, there we go. Yeah, okay. I hear you. Don't you hate it when the tools, they bark at you. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's see here. Oh, I knew why, because I had that turned off. Okay. So let's say I'm going to apply this to the feathers. So you can see as I paint over this, what an impact it has on these inside feathers. 
a lot of lot of detail coming out on them. And that is detail extractor. So if I were to turn this off and back on, I mean, you really see the impact of detail extractor there. Now, I don't know that I like quite that much. And within this tool, you can erase. So I could select, oh, I'm going to apply it, only a portion of it. So let's say I'm going to take away some of this. And so you can erase some. You can completely throw it away. You can do all these different things uh, once you bring it back into Photoshop. Um, okay, I'm going to just delete out of that. Uh, let me show you, I'm going to go into um, my raw image of, uh, let's see, which one? I think I'm going to start here. I'm going to do the wolves because this was an example of where my ISO was like 10,000. It was crazy high. And so I'm going to share with you uh, going through and what I do with the denoise. So first of all, this is the raw image. This is starting from scratch. This image is opened up now in Adobe Camera Raw. And I mentioned the two things that I like to do are to maximize the whites and maximize the blacks. Now, the histogram shows you the range of tones. You could just slide, and I think this is how it is in Lightroom and probably other tools, where you can just slide the histogram over. I personally like to use the whites and the black sliders. So I will press the, I use a PC versus a Mac. So I will press the Alt key and click the slider of the whites. It turns everything to black. And as I slide the slider to the white, it will tell me by colors when I've started to blow something out to all white. So I'm going to back off that so that I don't show anything. And now I know I've maximized my whites, which was a plus 28. Now to maximize my blacks, I do the exact same thing on the black slider. It turns it to all white. And as I slide to the left, it begins to show what's turning to all black. And I'm again, I'm going to back off so I don't have anything to all black, but I've maximized my whites and blacks this way. It, it, to me, it's a little more precise than relying on the histogram and sliding the histogram. And typically, that's about that's what I know I always do. There are some times where I will reduce the highlights, where I will, where I will increase the shadows. But for right now, I'm going to leave this as is, open it. One thing that's important in Adobe Camera Raw, I have my preferences set up. Again, my Pro Photo RGB color space. I also have it on 16 bits per channel. And I have my resolution at 360. I don't know, someone mentioned one time that that's better than 300. So I did it and I just kept it that way. I don't do any resizing, no sharpening, nothing else. I don't use smart objects. I just haven't found a need to do them, but there are definitely those that do. And those are my preferences. And I open the image into Photoshop. Now, I mentioned that in this photo, um, one of the things that's important is I do some cleanup. So down on the left here, I see, uh, I don't know, looks like some grasses, dead grasses. So I use the, um, the uh, spot healing brush and I run over that. Oops. I run my, my paintbrush over that and get rid of that, gone. And I usually crop before, if I'm going to crop, I crop before I go take the photo through the Topaz Denoise AI. So in this case, I did mention that I'm going, to, I knew I was going to crop the trees out. So I'm going to I'm going to go clear over to about there because, again, I want to, you know, and I, I generally will follow s rule of thirds or, and I, I really like golden spiral, the golden ratio. There's a multiple ways to, to help you crop in a way that works for the composition. I also mentioned that it's good to look at these at standard aspect ratios, and I have standard aspect ratio set up. And, and I try to stick within those when I can. So I'm going to crop a little bit on, I want to crop this tree out on the left. And now I'm going to bring, I don't need that much of the trees in the background. And like I said, every time I process an image, I do it slightly differently. And in this case, you know, I've got 
the one of the rule of thirds on one of the eyes or close to it and the other uh, line on part of the body of the other wolf so it kind of draws your eye anything that's on a line or a PowerPoint where those lines intersect can help in your composition so I'm going to go ahead and just crop there and then I'll run the plugin uh, the denoise AI and the way that I have denoise set up is and there I know that there are more exacting uh, um, settings, uh, but you know, I just, I'm, my thing is not really post-processing. I just know I have to do it. So I try to do it well, but I'd like to get things done as quickly as possible. So I use the clear setting, which basically analyzes your photo and comes back and tells you, uh, what level of noise removal and what level of, uh, in sharpening does, does does the tool think that this photo needs now again this photo was at about 10,000 ISO so really a lot of noise and it will process the image and it it tells you it's updated it if I move the viewing box it will reprocess it and it's it's a little slow comparatively speaking with other tools but I think this setting is works well in terms of speed and um, for me on this one I'll go between low and high on sharpening and removal of noise I'm pretty much always at medium and that's even if my ISO is at 200 I'm still using medium so I'll take a look at it see in particular what do the eyes look like have I removed the noise in the eyes and if I feel like it needs a little more, and in this case, I still have some noise in the eye, I might just try high on noise removal and see again, this was really high ISO 10,000 and just see what the difference is between the two. I kind of like high better and I'm just visually looking at it to see which one. And I, I think I like the the high on noise removal. I'm looking at other areas like fur to make sure that I haven't pixelated the fur in any way. And I think when I process this the first time, I probably used a high in noise removal. And I'll try the high in the sharpening and just see what that looks like. Looks pretty good. Um, and I'll look at the tips of where the snow is hitting the fur. Of, and this is, of course, blown up. So you're seeing it much larger than the average viewer is going to see it unless it's being enlarged to be framed. Uh, so I feel pretty good about that. Okay, so high noise removal, high in, in sharpness enhancement. And that's the only sharpening I do in total. Um, I'm very rarely, I don't do night photography. I'm very rarely doing anything to recover original detail or or eliminate color noise reduction or reduce color noise uh, so I'll click apply and it processes it brings it back into Photoshop and and so it's now got the sharpening it's got the noise removal and now I can do the final enhancements and one of the things that I do is check the white snow so is this snow white and in this photo it's hard to tell when you're only looking at one image to know how white could it be and have I really gotten it as wide as it can be so I use levels in Photoshop quite a bit uh, there's two ways I do it but this is one one of the ways that I find kind of easy and I'll click the I'll use the levels and I'll click the white eyedropper and I'll click in what I think is the brightest white of the photo and I'll click once and see have I blown something too far out and it looks like maybe I have so I'll click someplace else and I'm clicking trying to find the brightest white in the image to to then eliminate anything that is gray in the snow and I think that's pretty good if I turn this off you can see that I have brightened up that snow a little bit more so that helps um, it it's such a small change but it makes a difference when someone sees it and, it, and white is white um, I think that's it's really important the other thing that on this image that is really important are those eyes so I love increasing the brightness of the whiteness of the eyes so 
I will use brightness and contrast and I'll slide that brightness up to where I'm and I'm only looking at the eyes right now and to where I think it should be and then I'm going to mask it so on my PC I'm I'm typing control delete and then I'm selecting my paintbrush making my paintbrush the opacity 100% and then bringing that paintbrush down in size and just going over the whites of the eyes a little bit on that on that color and the other one there's a little bit of catch light there so I'm going to emphasize that and again that reflection of that in the bottom of the eyes and if I turn it off and on you can see what an impact that makes I mean it's to me it's amazing um, another thing I would do uh, on this is to use detail extractor uh, this is a good example for detail extractor um, let me see here And to do that, again, I would go into Color Effects Pro. Uh, it defaults to the previous uh, filter that you had applied, so it's bringing up Detail Extractor. And I'm going to click Brush and bring it back into Photoshop. And now I'm just going to paint the teeth. That's all I'm going to do, just paint the teeth. because those are my targets and, and, you know, and the impact uh, wasn't too significant. Um, the other thing I would probably do is darken down the nose. Um, there's snow on the noses and so they're not quite as dark and vibrant. Um, I don't recall what I did to, in the original that I showed you uh, because like I said, it's always different. But another tool that I like using in Color Effects Pro is uh, pro contrast and I'll just show you within this filter pro, pro contrast I only use the dynamic contrast slider and and as I slide that slider to the right in the top right menu you see the colors punch a little more and I like that look um, it's a it's everything punches and in this case I really like how it looks and so I probably will end up um, brushing it entirely into the deer and and the wolves and and maybe even a little bit on the trees in the background so I can increase the size of my brush and just paint it over and I'm not going to be too uh, careful right because I I don't think it really requires the carefulness and then I'll probably reduce the opacity down to maybe half and then paint over the background I don't want to have quite as much punch in the background again you're always wanting to have contrast so if you apply something to the entire image you may not get as much contrast between the subject or your targets and the background and foreground than you could get if you were a little more selective and then you click apply and then I'll just uh, mention we're about half past the second hour. And so I'm going to show you what I do when I'm saving. And then, uh, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, so when I'm saving, I'll save as. And if I was going to save this, I would, um, since I've already processed it, I'm going to put a, append it with a B. Um, but I'll save it as a TIFF and I save it with all the layers and you could save it as a PSD file, Adobe PSD file also with all the layers. I save it as a TIFF because I don't really want to be tied to Adobe even though I pretty much am or have been for so many years. But in case something changed, I don't want, I want to be able to open files that have all my layers with another tool. And so I, I save as TIFFs. I don't save as PSDs. So I would save it first as a TIFF, and then I would go back in and do a save as and save it as a JPEG and save it at the maximum. And then thirdly, like I mentioned, I will downsize it and I'll usually 1200 or so, 1000 to 1200 on the longest side. And then I will append it with, and let me just open up my, um, my signature. So I'll select that and copy and put it on the image 
and then downsize it by transforming it in Photoshop and then placing it down in the corner, something like that, usually just somewhere where I, it's visible. And then I'll save that out as a web appended. So I'll put the word web at the end of it and also save it as a JPEG and maximum. And there I've got my three files. So I started with the NEF, I saved it as a TIFF, then a high res JPEG, and then a web version of the JPEG. And I'm going to go back to questions now and see if there's anything in particular that anyone wants to see or ask about. And, and uh, if not, um, we might end a little early. So I'll look at look for any questions that the group might have. Uh, detail collection detail extractor is part of the NIC collection and it's under color effects pro when you get the NIC collection you get all of these collections of filters uh, DX, uh, Ken DXL pure raw now version 3 is the best I've seen for night photos they have a free trial thanks Ken awesome um, ever do any black and white conversions? Um, Joe, uh, I, I have a, a Nikon mirrorless that's been converted to infrared and I've done some conversions to black and white with that. And I have converted some photos with Silver FX Pro. I find I like um, my elephant photos in black and white. I like my rhino photos in black and white. So I find that I, I probably am converting more of either infrared or elephants or rhinos to black and white than much of anything else. But um, but I like black and white, though. And I think Silver Effects really can, does a nice job of black and white conversions. Uh, do you ever clone? Yes. Um, <laughs> in the photo, in, um, I, I don't, I'm not very good at cloning body parts. Uh, this was a mention, a question from Deb. I definitely clone like leaves and things that maybe to cover a bright spot in a photo. Uh, I've cloned, if there's a branch that's going through the head of the subject, I'll clone the, tw the twig out by cloning and being careful not to just swipe it across. Sometimes cloning is pretty messy. Uh, I prefer spot healing, <laughs> it's just easier, but I do, I do quite a bit of cloning when necessary. Uh, but I'm not very good at it, so it's gotta be simple stuff for me. And Jennifer is saying there's a 30 day trial for Nick collection. Uh, what's your favorite lens, favorite camera and lens combination? Oh, get me talking about that. So uh, I have two Nikon Z9s. And so that's my go to camera. Now I've sold all my DSLRs, but I have one Nikon Z72 that's converted to full color infrared. And I'm still learning how to shoot in full color infrared. Uh, my favorite lens now is the Z100 to 400, and I use that quite a bit. My the 70 to 200 is still fabulous, and I use my 70 to 200 all the time as well. And then my third favorite is my 500. It's a 5.6. It's a DSLR lens, but I use it with an adapter on my Z9. And then I have two other lenses. I have the Z24 to 120. And I have the, and it's an F4, and then I have a Z24, that's a 1.8. And so, but my favorite among those now is the 100 to 400. I really like that lens a lot. Any other questions? What's my favorite aspect ratio? Um, you know, in your uh, Tim is asking what's the favorite aspect ratio. Uh, when possible, I shoot 16 by 9. You know, when I'm in camera, I do choose to use uh, 16 by 9. I actually am waiting for software to come out where I can choose the aspect ratio because the aspect ratio for printing through Bay Photo, at least through SmugMug, 16 by 9 is not an option. It's 1 by 2, 1 by 3, 1 by 4, 1 by 5. 
and why our cameras are still on 16 by 9 when a lot of the printing is not 16 by 9 really really bothers me so i'm waiting for for the ratio to be available that i can set but i do shoot 16 by 9 uh, in camera at times and one by one in camera at times. Uh, I think it's the more that you have an idea of what you want to shoot in camera and, and actually really set up your composition that way, the better. 16 by nine shows well on my TV. Well, that's, that's good to know. I don't, I'd say I don't do a lot of showing on my television. So that's probably why I wasn't quick to say that. Thank you. Um, mentioned AI briefly. Yeah, what are my thoughts on AI? They're going to make us extinct as photographers. Uh, I think that uh, pretty soon, well, it's already what writing reports for, you know, you put in three or four words and it writes a three page report. Uh, and photos, I think that I think, you know, where I thought that if once you had a great wildlife photo, nothing could ever replace it, I think AI will replace it. I, I think it's it's neat, but it's kind of scary at the same time. Uh, I, I think the tools are amazing that we're using with post-processing, but as far as humanity, um, I'm kind of, I'm sort of with Elon Musk. I, I'm a little concerned. Um, did it take long to learn the Z9? I took a class, uh, Santa Fe workshops offered a class. Uh, it was a, a multi-day online webinar with a, Z9 expert, and we went through the entire menu system. Extremely helpful. I ended up changing a bunch of my settings as a result of that class because there were things I didn't know that were new that the, the documentation I couldn't understand. So I definitely suggest with any mirrorless camera that you're using to take a class with it. Uh, you noted that you use both camera raw and photo mechanics. Do you use one over the other in your post processing? So photo mechanics is not a post processing tool. Photo mechanics is just used to bring photos in, to cull them, to rank them, but not to process them. So whenever I choose to process an image, I select edit and I'm going into Adobe camera raw at that point. Uh, no, I do not. Jennifer's asking if I do my own printing. No, <laughs> not at all. I, don't, I had a printer years ago. It was like, oh, my inks dried up. My calibration got off. It's like, no, I don't. I know there's tech people that love to do their own printing and, and I have no interest in learning that. So I'm perfectly okay with letting pay photo do that for me. Um, Topaz Denoise AI versus Topaz Photo AI. You know, I bought Topaz Photo AI and I haven't used it yet. So I don't, I don't have an opinion on that yet. Um, was the class online for the Z9? Yes, it was. Um, I, and I would say just go out to Santa Fe workshops and, and, and look for online classes. It was excellent. Uh, it was four two hour online webinars and I can go back and rewatch them anytime. Um, I probably won't because I attended each one and I got all my questions answered. Um, Oh, and good to know. Really like the photo AI. Yeah, I, I think I think Topaz AI tools are incredible. I did buy the video AI and I also haven't used that yet, but plan to. Uh, Santa Fe Workshop been updated for a 3.1 version. Yes, it, uh, the, the Santa Fe Workshop that I attended uh, was the 3.1 version. It was just recently that I attended it. And in fact, they had us, which I didn't know that Lens needed to be had their firmwares updated too. So they pointed out what lenses had firmware updates and I went in and updated my firmware updates on lenses, which I didn't even know that you needed to to do that. So that was a good learning. All right, well, it seems that we may be at the end of the session and I want to thank everyone for joining me and I will be, I am recording and I'll be sending out that link here uh, within the next 24 hours and I encourage you to feel free to ask me any questions after the fact and Ken 
the winner of our contest from the beginning, I'll be sending you an email to schedule that walkthrough of your images. And I'm going to stop the recording now, and then I'll say goodbye to everybody.